あ。Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of Between a Pot and the Hard Place. I'm Stephen Colton. And I'm Chris Kirkpatrick. And I almost didn't make it. Um, you yeah. almost didn't make it. Well, because it was a weird day. Like, I normally, this new job, I've been working like 6.30 a.m. to about 2 or 3. And this off day of come in at 11 a.m. until 7. I'm like, oh, huh. okay, and that's weird. It was some sort of weird scheduling thing, but. But yeah, I kind of wanted to kick things off talking about like why I almost didn't make it. It was okay. stressful. Like all day I was like the first few hours I was just, you know, running a cash register like normal. And of course I talked about this place and we kind of figured out that I work at a restaurant essentially. And today I was like, okay, I'm doing the job first couple of hours. I'm like, okay, after like two or three, I'm going to be doing different things. I know this already. Right. So I don't know what. And they were like, you're going to cook pizza today. I'm like, no, I'm not. And so instantly we got a shout out to Jay and Todd. Todd is specifically because, you know, he portrayed the, the character of Crispin and was the guy that worked in the pizza place. I'm sitting here thinking like, oh, my gosh, I'm cra- I've am i gone full Crispin. Um, I'm sitting here like making pizzas now and I'm wearing a shirt. And um, but, yeah, I, I knew what a shirt was. Right. That's I'm like, good. I'm like, uh, yeah, but yeah, I had this little, this little visual aid. I actually just ate some of this when I got home. Um, these little pizzas, this, this little boxes, they come in. I'm like, okay. let's, let's show this. Let's advertise this. I'm not, <laughs> I'm, I'm not doing it just because I work at a place that sells these, but I just think I'm kind of excited I mean, that I learned it. It totally looks like a Lunchable though. It kind of does. It's like a little box, you know, of course, you know what a box is. Um, <laughs> But yeah, these little pizzas, they cook them whole. I sat here waiting with this. I'm like, and this is going to be fun and exciting. Um, we we make a whole pizza, and then we cut it four ways, and then box each piece up and sell it. I think a, a single piece is like, I can't remember. I sell them all day long, but I can't remember how much they are. It's like 360 or something like that for a single piece. And people think like, wow, a piece of pizza is $3. Like, it's a quarter of a pizza. It's a 12-inch pizza, so... That's not too bad. Um, I got to give the, uh, Todd credit, though, and, and, and Crispin, the character, um, because these pizzas are mostly pre-made. It's, you know, it's kind of not cheap, but they're decent quality. You know, they, the yeah, crust, yeah. the cheese, not, the sauce, yeah. all that's pre-made. You're not, really, you're, not, you're not tossing the dough in the air. No, like, because, like, it. honestly, if I had to do all that, I probably would have left the job. I'm <laughs> like, nope. <laughs> Um, because then again, though, I don't think they would have thrown me in it like that and experienced had that been the case because right. they're like the question kind of, no one literally asked me this, but I, in my head, I hear, have you ever made a pizza? No. Do you know how to make a pizza? No. All right. We'll come make a pizza. Huh. He doesn't even know what a shirt is, right. um, but right. yeah, I had that thought. So like literally all you do is you, you know, they're frozen in plastic. It's almost like going to the grocery store, buying a frozen pizza without the toppings. And you open it up and you put all the toppings on it and then you just put it on this little metal kind of like conveyor belt thing and it pulls it into an oven and spits it back out. And that's all you do. You don't even have to press a button. So honestly, cooking a frozen pizza at home is more difficult. Right. Because there's actual like effort. Um, but I got really excited. I was like, once I did it, I was like, oh, wow, this is awesome. Um, but there's more to it than just cooking pizzas. There's other food. I barely got to scratch the surface of the kitchen work. Um, and that's because like, they just threw me in there. There was like no way that, you know, the, the people on that shift could do it all themselves because there's a bar there's, which oddly enough, so many people come into a gas station to drink beer. That's weird. I mean, it's weird to me. Um, but it is what it is. Like they make a, a good amount of money there. Um, <laughs> And then, you know, there's lottery and then there's kitchen, like the three main areas of the store. And I got to learn a lot of that. I learned how to uh, empty garbage bags today, which before now I never knew how to do that, which I'm glad I learned because all this garbage in my house is piling over. And now I can finally change it because I know how. Um, Hopefully people out there know I'm joking. Um, (laughs) But, yeah, I think that was cool. And just to, like, throw out one more little thing. I kind of I talked about you know the brand of pizza. It's Hunt Brothers Pizza, and 
I was like, have you ever heard of it? And I apparently nowhere on the West Coast or Western part of the United States at all has this. I, I've never heard of it. But it does reach out all the way to Texas, I believe. <clears throat> so I'm going to share, like, if I can remember how to do this. Yeah, here we go. I'm going to share a little screen, not a screenshot, but just a little um, a little thing here to kind of show the coverage of the, of the United States. You know, they have almost the entire eastern side of the whole country, with the exception of the northeast, for some reason. I guess because the northeast, it's like, how dare you put pre-made pizzas in our territory of like Brooklyn pizzas and all I this and that. Imagine that New Yorkers might not care for it very much. But then again, up in um, Illinois, there you know Chicago pizza. It's like, but whatever. They they have a lot of coverage. Um, yeah, many many in the southeastern United States around. You know that's big the here, but I didn't realize how far they reached. So I just kind of yeah. wanted to share that a little bit. I'm, I'm surprised. It's almost like there was a line that's like we're not going to go any further than here. They hit Colorado and they're done. Sorry, I'm like, we am <laughs> getting a little camera focused. Yeah, it's weird. I mean, I don't know a lot of history about that company. It's like a franchise thing, so different. Uh, mostly convenience stores. It was licensed out the name, I guess, and they use their pizzas. And, you know, it's – and for, for what it is, they're actually pretty decent pizzas. I just ate a big chunk for uh, dinner tonight, and I've got another one I'm either going to eat for tonight or in at 5 a.m. for breakfast. Who knows? You're going to be eating a lot of pizza. Yeah, I've been eating a lot of the, the food there, which I have to be back at work again at 6.30 in the morning, which is going to be like kind of crazy because this day started very stressful because I was just like panicking. I'm like, I don't know how to make a pizza. I'm going to be fired. I can't afford it. Lose this job. What am I going to do? I'm, I was like thinking of ways like, what if I get sick and have to leave early? Like all these things going through my head. But then I was like, okay, it's not that big of a deal. Yeah, you realized it was pretty easy. Yeah, once I realized that like a microwave was more difficult, I was like, oh, okay. And I've done garbage. I had to stock a little bit of a cooler. That's that's what the side, that's what they call the side person, which, you know, you're a register, you're sweeping, you're mopping, you're stocking, you're doing all this stuff. Which is why I prefer to be on the lottery side is because all I'm doing all day is literally running a register and selling lottery, cashing in lottery. You do nothing else. Light work, like light sweeping and a few things here and there, but overall, you're you're prone in this one spot in this little corner, and I like that. But you knew that was only going to last for a short amount of time. Well, I mean, primarily, yeah, I and mean, primarily, I'm going to be on that side because you know the manager, like yesterday, he was like, "You prefer this, right? We're going to have you to the lottery all week next week." I'm like, "Yeah, okay, great." Well, some people, it, it was nice to be able to get out and move and do several different things today, and not just be in one spot. I noticed, you know, my legs and feet and body in general are way less sore. Um, I'm way less, I'm, I'm, more, I'm way more energized now that I'm home. I'm just like, yeah, let's go. Showtime. I'm going to play video games all night and not sleep at all, <laughs> which might be the case because I'm off the following day. So if I don't sleep at all tonight, when I get off at like three tomorrow, I'll have plenty of time to nap and all that. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to talk about that real quick. And who knew I could talk about gas station pizza for eight minutes? I know it's a, it's a skill. I will tell you, you know, I've made a lot of pizzas, um, you know, growing up, it was probably one of the first things that my mom taught my brother and I had to do was to mm. make homemade pizza. And I, I think I've been perfecting my recipe, um, for years, but I will tell you, I make, I make a considerable mess. Uh, <laughs> so again, my hat is off to you. I, I've always wondered how people make pizza, at a restaurant and don't just totally destroy the kitchen in the process. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, this was easy, honestly. It's one of those weird things. I'm sure, I'm sure Todd could, could talk about this if he were on, we didn't actually ask him when they were on before about like the specifics of making pizzas and how tedious it can be and how little tiny things like, for instance, today they're like, okay, so a pepperoni pizza has 25 pepperonis. I'm like one, two, three, four, like, the first one I made, I had about 10 or so, and I forgot to count. I'm like, oh, wait, I didn't count. One, two, three, four, five, six. And then like a, a lots of meat pizza, which is what I had tonight was, is basically pepperoni, beef, sausage, and ham, I think. There's like 12 or 15 pieces of pepper. It's just so oddly specific. Right. It's like if it's lots of meat, why don't you just have the standard 25 pepperonis, then a handful of beef and a handful of this? And Why does it have to like the more ingredients you have, the less of each ingredient you, you use. 
I, mean, I get it. It's conserving the, the, the ingredients, saving money and all this and that, but they do have custom orders. So if you want extra toppings, they don't really charge you for anything. They don't like to give you tons and tons, but if you ask for extra pepperoni, they're like, oh, okay. But you have to kind of specifically ask for that. But yeah, I mean, it's it's fun. It's not hard. I'm sure that once you kind of get into your rhythm and get used to it, you won't have to count them anymore. You'll just know how much goes on there. And I think we have, uh, I think Jay's actually watching right now. So, oh, really? Okay. So yeah, I mean, he, he liked this uh, tonight. And so Jay, thanks. And if, and if you know, if, if you can tell Todd, like, hey, I'm the, I'm the real Crispin. I've, I've gone full Crispin. So, <laughs> I mean, I've even admired um, attractive women today. So, I mean, wow. I, I did that. I had, you know, all these little things. It's like I pretty much lived that movie, except for the fact that there were no pinball machines anywhere. Um, I did play a video game earlier, but. Maybe you could make a recommendation to add a pinball machine. Yeah, that's like the going full Crispin checklist. Right. I need a pinball machine, and I need some guy to insult me that works there. And that's about it, I think. Yeah. Well, and apparently, I, think, I need like 20 people that don't have cigarettes that always ask me for them. And, right. Right. But. Weren't you going to quit? Um, I was like, I don't want to do this job. I think it's like stressful. <laughs> I mean, it still is stressful, and there's still a lot to learn, but. I think my nerves are kind of like lower. Now the bar, there's, you know, like I mentioned, there's a bar. I haven't done that yet. I've watched it a couple of times or today specifically where the lady working, she was like, okay, can you watch this while I go? Cause we kind of take turns having little breaks and stuff, go to the restroom, the smoke break, whatever it is. We take turns. And so I came back in and she's like, can you, can you watch this? I'm like, I've never done this before. It's okay. Just stand there. I'm like, all right. And so, I mean, really the hardest part about it is, like, there's the whole cleaning the bar and there's the whole, like, washing dishes because you have glasses and all this. And then pouring the actual beer, which I've never done ever, even for myself. If I ever drank a beer, it was, like, out of a bottle or a can where someone else handed it to me. I've never poured anything like that, especially from a tap. Now, I did do root beer once um, at the A&W restaurants that I'm not sure how far those reach out or if they even exist anymore. But they have a. They used to have this uh, tap of root beer, and so that's similar, I would imagine. But uh, there was no pressure of someone watching me. I wasn't like right on. So it's like, oh gosh, I, I, uh, I would, I would freak out. Like, put too much beer would go everywhere. I'd drop the glass. It would shatter, and I'd run away crying. Probably. I mean, maybe not crying, but who knows? So we'll see what happens if I ever do that job. Right. You know, I'm sure you'll do just fine. Probably. And you, you probably need to go there and, you know, test merchandise just to yeah. make sure that it's, you know, good quality beer. You know, I actually, that. yeah, I actually asked about that. I was like, so, so my first day I thought about like, I haven't had beer in a while. Maybe I'll have one. And then they're like, oh, you can't drink at your own store, which was kind of a bummer because after a long, stressful day, if you're like, I want a beer, you have to go to a different location yeah. in order to enjoy the bar. Yeah. I mean, I can kind of see it in some ways, you know. They don't want you drinking because if like, I don't really know. Cause I thought it was like, if you're there drinking and they need to call you in, they can't because you're drinking. But yet if you go somewhere else and drink and they call you in, you're like, I'm at another location drinking. Oh, is that okay to come in still? I mean, I so I really don't know their reasoning. I guess if you're friends with someone you work with and they try to give you a discount or something to avoid all that, I mean, it kind of makes sense. Maybe it's about the, the optics of it appearing like you're an employee drinking on a job. Exactly, yeah. That's what it is. Which is kind of a bummer. I mean, it wasn't super like, okay, that's a deal breaker. I'm not working here because then it's like, that gives the impression I'm some raging alcoholic or something like that, which nowhere near it. I rarely drink. And if I do, it's like one beer. So, but how about that one division? Such a harsh transition. Okay. I, I've got to say, I, I, first of all, <laughs> I feel like we, we, we've dedicated this time to. Um, to pizza, um, <laughs> do we have the the information for Northwood Pie? Um, yes. Uh, let's see here. I have this stuff up. All three Twitter handles that I planned on doing, and let's go to the comments. And I have not seen the comments. Okay, so actually, I'll throw a couple of these comments up real quick before we throw th yeah. these guys' information out. Um, Gas station barbecue, says Corey. So it's like, okay, I don't know if we have barbecue. Um, 
there we do have wings. And he also says, you quit smoking and I will lose some weight. All right, well, hmm. This seems like a bet. Like, should I actually quit smoking right now and then and then we'll see how far we can go. It's an interesting thing. Yeah. We should we should do a game about this. Like tell tell viewers, like, hey, like what are you what would you be willing to do? If I quit smoking, you should um, build a Lego house full size. If I quit smoking, or it's like, what would you do for a Klondike bar? Right. Right. <laughs> okay, I got a notification here saying that the Streamyard lost access to Facebook, but it says we're still live. Okay. So hopefully this show isn't completely lost. Right. Because it's connected. All right. Well, we'll see what get, what happens. Who knows? So if anybody's out there, let us know if you can still see us and hear us or if we're just talking to ourselves. Okay. Boom. We got this coming up. All the Northwood pie. Oh, I can't. It might take a minute. We have a little glitch. There's some kind of little glitch here. I mean, we're still live. Um, we're still going, it looks like. Um, it's just that there is no connection for some reason to Facebook. Like, I guess... The stream is still going, but yet there's comments and stuff are disabled. That's weird. Okay, so my good friend, um, my other good friend, Chris, who it says we can, I can still hear you and see you. So that's good to know. Um, don't know why it won't let me comment. Okay. I guess we'll, we'll, put those, we'll put those in at the end. Let me try that again really quick just to see. Oh. Maybe, it, maybe it was just a glitch. Okay, yeah, so it looks like it's fixed. Okay. Um, so it's at Northwood Pie for their film page. We have at J. Don't I'm not going to pronounce their last names because I never will get it right. And okay. at Todd, but in German. See, I like Todd's because he, he doesn't have his name, and I'm bad with names. So one day I'll get it right, though. Yeah, I, I think I can do Todd's just fine. Yeah, I mean his his isn't too difficult. I say that now, but I'm like I'm not going to attempt it because right. I can't remember like what right. it was. So yeah, I'm not going to attempt it either. Just on the off chance that I still get it wrong. Right, I'm not good with names at all. I just say the guy that had the glasses. <laughs> there we go. There we go. And that's well, you know. I know you were trying to find a clever segue into uh, Wandavision. Um, let's just hop right in. First of all. What have you been waiting for all this time? I really don't know. I think because I was like, oh, I don't have Disney Plus, so I can't watch it. Right. Then I thought, well, get Disney Plus. Then you can watch it multiple yeah. times. And it's relatively I, cheap. I really – it is like a eight, eight bucks a month, I think, and you have all of the Marvel movies completely. And we just heard not too long ago within the last week that uh, Sony is actually allowing Spider-Man, I believe, to come to Disney Plus. Right. And so that's really exciting because I, I guess it's homecoming and far from home. And then were, I'm guessing the new one, uh, No Way Home, is going to be on there. I don't know if it's going to be one of those like stream it on Disney Plus and theaters. Like, I don't know if it's going to be that like that. Um, and also, I mean, it's not related to that show, but, you know, Superman and Lois is now streaming on HBO Max. And from my understanding, I felt kind of like a jerk because someone commented like, yeah, no, there's going to be more budget. I'm like, no, they're just airing it there, idiot. But it's like they actually are apparently doing a shared budget. Right. And it's going to be like a shared – from what I understand, it's going to be kind of like um, the first season of Stargirl in a sense where they're going to have like a, a, a shared funding kind of thing where they're um, airing it on both platforms. Okay. So if that's the case, that's going to be even better because you know we're going to have such a higher production value. With, not that it's terrible now, but still. But yeah, uh, WandaVision – I mean, and I actually watched the first episode of uh, Falcon and Winter Soldier, too, but uh, I haven't watched that show enough to really talk too much about it. But the first episode was really good. I really enjoyed it. So um, we'll, and save, we'll save Falcon and the Winter Soldier for next week. Yeah, by next week, I should have all those. I probably will watch them all on Tuesday when I'm off. So um, what was your what was your what kind of your impression of, of the story and everything? You know, I really loved it. I really loved it. And I knew a little bit of the detail going in, like how each – each episode was essentially a decade of TV and, you know, season one starts out with um, basically was it bewitched or like kind of like, um, or was that the episode second episode? It was, it was very, the second episode was bewitched. The yeah. One was, um, was sort of like, um, and I love Lucy. Okay. Um, yeah. 
they were kind of close together, like the style. So it kind of like felt like one it, big. It was Dick Van Dyke is what it was. Dick Van Dyke. Yeah, that's right. Because yeah. she, and I love the fact that, I mean, this is kind of going to be a little bit of a spoiler, but I mean, we're probably going to spoil it anyway, talking about it like this. Right. So if you haven't watched it, pause this episode of the show, go watch all of WandaVision, and then instantly come back here. Right. Um, and don't sleep at all in between. Um, but anyway, yeah. So we find out later in the series that she watched all of these shows when she was in her little like bunker kind of area. And that's why she's envisioning all these sitcoms. And I love the fact that they showed the actual shows later and kind of like, it makes me wonder like, I wonder how much they paid to use all these. Um, because like every show that they like portrayed, they showed clips of, and I loved, I loved the moment. I got to jump forward a little bit when they're watching Malcolm in the middle and then vision was like, ha ha ha. And finally laughs at it. Right. I loved that moment. He's like, that was funny. I loved the Malcolm in the middle episode too. It was, it was really cool. I think that was probably what kind of, you know, grabbed me and my family right from the beginning was just, there was, there was a real cleverness to it. Mm -hmm. I think for, 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 for some people, they watched the first episode, the first two episodes and they thought that essentially they were just making fun of classic TV. Yeah. And they didn't really get what it was building to. Um, mm. That it, it's not just them making classic TV shows with Elizabeth Olsen and Paul Bettany, right? Right. And I thought, I thought that, you know, it, it seemed like they were, the, it was this very kind of slow, you, uh, you don't realize exactly what's going on until about the third episode. Um, you know, that's when that's when we're introduced to uh, Tiana Paris as Monica Rambo. Uh, yeah, and that really confused me at first. I was like, she comes out of this, you know, I want to call it a simulation, but it's not really a simulation. But she comes out of the Matrix, and uh, and I was like, wait a minute, does she not remember? like being in there, but then it was like, Oh, okay. She does, but it's, it was a weird transition out. And she, just, and then it, it caught me off guard because I completely forgot about the blip. I completely forgot that this was post end game. Yeah. And so I was like, wait, why does she not remember the last five years of her life? And how was she, you know? Yeah, no, I, I was with you. And when I, when, during the first couple of episodes, I didn't know where to place it. Mm -hmm. I knew that they were in this, this, you know, simulated reality um, that that clearly Wanda had created. Mm -hmm. I had kind of assumed that Vision was in on it. Um, yeah. But, but, but a lot of it was, I thought, well, maybe this happened in between uh, the events of Civil War and Endgame. And yeah. They were, getting, they were getting that period where they, where they had some happiness while they were on the run together. And I thought that might be it. But we, we find out later on that this all happens um, after the blip, after everybody comes back. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Thanos is dead. They've won, yep. they've won this Infinity War. Uh, everybody is returned. And, um, and we have, at, at this point now, we have Wanda, who is, um, you know, dealing with the loss of, a vision really for the first time. Mm -hmm. And um, I, yeah, it was just a real, it was a real powerful thing. And so the, the realization that she is using her powers in order to bring back the man that she loves and recreate this fantasy of this perfect life that she and vision were denied. Um, you know, that was, that was it was sad, in a way. Mm -hmm. you know? But at the same time, I part of me couldn't blame her. I mean, if if yeah. you, power, you think about it, if you had the power to bring back someone that you had lost, would you do it? Oh, uh, probably, absolutely, yeah. Because it's like it would be hard not to, honestly. Because you're not really altering time in a sense. You're kind of you kind of are, but you're you're more just physically bringing them back, which I didn't realize until. You know, when Vision tried to leave or was being pushed out, whatever, that these creations were only able to exist inside of this bubble. 
Right. But then I thought, could she step out of it and recreate them outside of it? Well, and as we, but, as we found, as the, as things got went further, and she expanded the boundaries mm-hmm. um, of the town, and her powers grew and enveloped everybody, uh, even outside of it. Um, you know, she certainly could. But then everybody, everybody that got brought in, now essentially was held captive. Right? Yeah. I mean, that was the that was the twisted part of the entire storyline is that that somehow Wanda didn't realize that she uh, she was unintentionally holding the townspeople hostage, that they were literally suffering uh, and kind of forced yeah. to these these characters. And um, you know, there there had been some moments where we had where we had realized that people were acting kind of strange. Mm-hmm. Right? That they they couldn't really remember, uh, you know, who they were or what they were doing. Uh, that made um, I forget which episode it was. It was um, the Modern Family episode, which that took me for a minute to figure out what is this show right. supposed to be. And then I saw it, and I was like, "Oh, I got it!" Especially when they did this little like video, like confessional things. And that right there, I was like, "So, <clears throat> especially when the production guy's talking to them, you're like, you're not supposed to be talking. <laughs> Who was that? Like, how did they envision in her head and her reality that she created? She created cameramen because the rest of them were like just sitcoms. It was their reality, but yet here, this reality was the fact that they knew they were on TV. So that was weird to me. Like, I was like." Wait a minute. It was almost like my thought process of time travel. I was like, if he's there, then how could, but but then it was funny though. It was pretty funny. It was. And and you know, we we had already been familiar with the character, you know, Kat Dennings, mm-hmm. uh, played by Darcy Lewis. And we'd also known um, you know, Randall Park, um, played by mm-hmm. Jimmy Woo, right? We seeing them come together and essentially um, you know, kind of be the good guys. Yeah, um, you know, and they're and they kind of stumble upon the broadcast of one yeah. that been by accident, and so there were little commercials that we had seen of people, you know, watching one division on the screen, and mm. um, you know that had been that had been Cat, um, uh, Darcy, and Jimmy, and the rest of the agents there, um, kind of keeping an eye on what's happening um, inside you know, that, that, that field. And yeah, I really loved how they had to get an old like CRT model TV to watch this. Right. It was like an analog signal. So and I don't know why, I mean, I know that was the funny part about it because you, they had to do that, but it's like with Wanda being so powerful, she couldn't, she couldn't like mentally broadcast an HD signal. I, I, I think that she, I think that she could, I think that for her, uh, because of the, I think the emotional connection that she had to the mm-hmm. original black and white broadcast, you know, that's how she learned English. It, yeah. was that, it was that special time that she had spent with her family. And so uh, I think she was being authentic and true to herself. In that. Yeah, that makes sense. But um, I think, I don't know at what point for me, um, I really grasped just the seriousness of the situation about how, people really were were trapped. I remember that when you were watching it, um, you were you would you would specifically mention the the words of uh, Sharon Davis, um, uh, Deborah Joe Rupp, mm-hmm. um, where uh, you know uh, her husband was choking at the dinner party. Yeah. And like stop it. Stop it. And mm-hmm. um, and Wanda tells Vision to help him. And um uh, you know, we think that she's telling her husband to stop it, to just stop choking. Mm. And uh, you know what we what we don't really realize at the time is it's really more of a of a cry for help. Yeah, she's begging, <clears throat> she's begging Wanda to stop it. Um, you know, I noticed a few things like that in that show. Like they make you think one thing, and then it's kind of like. Um... Oh gosh, I have a terrible memory. But when uh, there was a moment where someone says, "Like, do you think they'll figure it out? You'll think they'll see through this?" It's like instantly, it's like, okay, you're talking about the literal audience watching the show right now, right? 
And I thought that was great. I loved how they would tie that in. Yeah. Even the, even the moments where, uh, you know, like certain things bled through the, mm-hmm. the helicopter. Or that was, was awesome. The, oh. the drone becomes the toy helicopter. And, mm-hmm. uh, uh, and the guy who crawled through the sewers and emerges as yeah. a helicopter. And, uh, and you see Wanda sort of like rewinding time. Yeah, that was pretty cool. And sort of like starts to figure things out and question. Um, you know, those were those were moments where you were like, "Wow, I now I see what's going on here." Yeah, I mean that that's such a smart show, and for people that even that have finished watching it that still kind of hate on it, it's like it's, it doesn't feel like Marvel. It doesn't feel like Marvel, and I can kind of get where they're coming from, but it's. I don't know. I love the way it played out. Like it doesn't play out like a Marvel movie because it's not really a movie. It's a, like a mini series. Really, is the best way to describe it. It's not a TV show, but it's not quite a movie either. So my, um, my argument that I will give in this whole situation is that that argument only holds water if you only watch the first three episodes. Right. If you watch the first three episodes and that's all you watched, then you you might have a valid point about. You know mm-hmm. about it not being very Marvel, but it's much more just situational comedy with Marvel characters. Yeah. However, after after you hit, um, you know, episode three at the end, and Wanda literally expels Monica Rambo. I mean, literally blasts her through the wall, Oof. all the way across uh, a couple miles through the air. Where she mm-hmm. emerges outside of the the sphere of Wanda's influence, uh, and we were re- and we realize that the situation that Wanda has created and the military that is set up to try to deal with her, um, you know, after that point, we realize there's there there's two different stories that are mm-hmm. going on: what's happening inside and what's happening outside. You know, I think one thing for me that I had that I had realized was Wanda was a place in her power that that really there wasn't anybody that was going to go in and take her family from her, right? The right. military wasn't going to be able to go and launch a drone <laughs> or drop a bomb on her or attack her physically uh, in a way that would make her give up. Right, they were completely overpowered by her, and those that tried ended up getting kind of absorbed into her own delusion. Right, mm-hmm. um, I knew that whatever happened, ultimately Wanda was going to have to go and 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 deal with her loss directly and let people go. I just kind of knew that already. I don't think I realized just how traumatic that was going to be because. We, we had this discussion that uh, in, the, in the third episode, Wanda ends up doing something that we thought was, was completely impossible, right? Can you still hear me? I can hear you. Yeah. Okay, my, my video is a little messed up. Okay. But um, and I'm still here. That's good because I was like, what, what's going on? Right. Yeah, you're, you're frozen. But it's a little here. weird. Sorry, folks. I don't know what happened here. Now it's like <laughs> it's a little strange. Well, we'll see can, if I can get it going. Yeah, we'll keep going though here, and oh yeah, hopefully we'll it'll it'll work for us. Uh, hopefully, yeah. But Wanda gets pregnant. Ah, you might, go, you might go. You know, what's the big deal about Wanda getting pregnant? Mm-hmm. You know, and and I thought it was funny. You had you had said that well, Vision. Uh, you know, you thought the vision could father children. Yeah, at first I didn't think about it. I was like, wait a minute, he is a. Ro-. Like, I knew he was mechanical, but at the same time, I was like, I thought since he had living flesh on him and he had blood and like certain organic elements that he might be able to produce like sperm cells, or maybe he could use like nanotechnology to create like artificial ones to like actually impregnate a, a female human. Like, I wasn't sure, but uh, the more I thought about it, and you mentioned it, I was like, you know, you're right. He is pretty much just a full robot. Like he couldn't really do that. And then that made me realize like how 
important like the children being alive for her in that reality was because it's like they weren't they were real but not um and then you see her at the end kind of like studying or whatever to try to bring them back essentially right well and, and i think that you know um the the fact that she ends up with children i think that was um it was something that she had wanted mm-hmm. she, she had she had really envisioned um, having a life with Vision, right? We, we find out later on that, you know, after Vision had essentially died and she had played her part in destroying the Infinity Stone and then watching uh, the stone brought back into Vision and then, like, ripped out of his head and seeing him die. She oh, gosh. Goes back to the, to the place where they were going to build their house and... And she has that in, in right there in New Jersey, and she just loses it. Um, you know, goes full carry, and um, and kind of creates that that facade, um, having children with the man that she that she loved, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, even if even if having real children with Vision was never going to happen, um, right? You know, for her that was that was kind of like you know, her way of, again, kind of coping, um, mm-hmm. you know, the the tragedy that we find in all of it is that um, she's using chaos magic that she really doesn't know how to use. Yeah. And she's so powerful that she just even, doesn't even know she's using it half the time, you know, because all the people in the town, like she doesn't know, she knows none of this is real, but she doesn't know how that person is acting the way they're acting or why, you know, and that's one thing I never really understood. I guess maybe I missed it. Why they had to hide Vision's true form or whatever from everyone else, if they all knew that, like secretly, they knew inside they couldn't act on it, but they knew this was all like fake. Because, like you said, they're being tortured the entire time. So I, I wonder why they had to hide his identity or whatever. I think that I think that within within that reality, you know. Vision didn't realize that that they were hiding. I think that he really that he that she had created him uh, to to really to really believe that they were living there in that community. Um, yeah, and 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 even and even the vision that she that she created, he really c- could not remember what life was like before this. Right. Uh, you See, know, I, I wasn't sure well, going into the show. Like I saw, uh, you know, frames of him as himself, right. and frames of him in like a human form. So I wasn't really sure what to expect out of all that. Right. It, it did seem like as the show progressed, though, that uh, that he spent more time as Vision and less time as his human self. Right. Right. Yeah. That seemed to be, um, you know, pretty apparent. And I think what was what was interesting to see is how the further we go along, the less control that Wanda seemed to have over things. Yeah. Right? I mean, she couldn't control her children, right? Um, they, mm-hmm. they really had their own, their own minds and she couldn't, she could not seem to control them. And when vision started to kind of see, see through uh, this this facade that she had created, uh, you know, she even even kind of rewinding him, he kept figuring it out. And yeah, because so, there's no way that she could control him. Out of all things and all people, he always had a way to like, okay, what's going on here? I know this is ridiculous. Yeah, so I, I think that we we knew that that whole situation was going on. That was really like the second story. The story that was going on inside, then there was the story that was going outside, and then we find yep. out that the the nosy neighbor um, played, you know, Agatha. Yeah. Uh, we find out that you know it was Agatha all along. Then you never would have thought, honestly. Like I, I saw that and I was like, wait, what? It's her? It could have been. It should have been. Well, it it should have been her. Like she played that so perfectly. She I really was, did. I mean, so perfect. I mean, she played dumb so well. She played the evil witch so well. 
I love the, I don't know if it was a direct and obvious Wizard of Oz reference, but when she's laying there with her feet sticking out, <laughs> like under, I think I'm not even under a house, but still, like she's laying there. I'm like, it's Wizard of Oz. Right, right. But I, I really do feel like it was one of those, one of those great reveals. Um, yeah. You know, and I, and I think that, you know, typical, um, the, the person that you trust that you never see coming happens to be the one that that really has been pulling the strings all this time. Yeah. Uh, but but brilliant as Agatha that she is this this powerful witch who is um, manipulating all of these scenarios, trying to essentially um, steal Wanda's powers. Yeah. Like the, you kind of it, it slowly clicked in my head. Like it was like, oh, it's her the whole time. Oh, oh, and it was really cool. Like I don't know, you know, I for I know for a lot of people um, that have you know watched Wanda develop over the years, a lot of them had had voiced concern that she had really never called herself Scarlet Witch. Yeah, right. And you never actually saw her costume. Right, um, because it it hadn't existed yet. Right, that all of that really, this is sort of introducing her as the Scarlet Witch, mm -hmm. um, and and I think that we we kind of realize that everything that she's done, you know, fighting the Avengers, participating in the Civil War, um, all of the run up to the Infinity War and Endgame, everything that she's really done has only been using this small piece of the power that she has, right? We, mm -hmm. we thought her abilities were really just, you know, mental telepathy and manipulation and telekinesis. And yet we find that, you know, she's able to use chaos magic in order to rewrite reality and that she is this super powerful uh, witch yeah, I mean, it seems like Barry Allen on the on the Flash would really could really use her magic. It's right. like here, just make my mom and dad come back now without changing all of that. Right. And for God's sakes, give Cisco his brother back. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's a really cool. I loved how they revealed that. It's like she. Yeah, I really, I really agree. Yeah. And her costume, seeing her actual costume in the end, was amazing. Right. I was like, oh, it's that because you kind of see it earlier on in the Halloween episode where they're. That was the now was that the Malcolm in the Middle episode, I believe, or was that the either way when they're right. dressed up as Halloween and she has the witch thing and everything? I was like, ooh, and Vision is Vision, but yet he's supposed to be like something else. They're, they're wearing they're wearing the comic accurate, uh, yeah, you know, uh, versions of themselves, which is amazing that they kind of like great. it was so so good. Um, I think that. The part of the show that was the real, the real, I guess, you know, heartbreaker, tearjerker part of it was the realization that, uh, you know, she, Wanda realizes that she has been hurting these people. Yeah, because she's kind of in a denial state at first. Like, no, no, I haven't. No, I haven't. They're fine. Look, see? And, and then, then she realizes, yeah. She realizes that she's... She's been holding these people captive, and and uh, when she when she realizes that, she wants to release them, mm -hmm. and then you know Agatha lets her know that she is uh, she has tied her children and Vision um, to that reality that by releasing the people, she would also be destroying her family, and uh, my gosh, see I always wondered too. I was like. Why didn't they just why, why didn't Wanda just shrink the bubble down to just their house? And then that way the family could all exist, but they could just never leave the house. They could always just stay there and Wanda could go get a job at like Pizza Hut or something and come back at the end of the day like, honey, I'm home. And then, you know, they'd all be there living happily ever after, which would kind of be insane. But then she could make individual bubbles around each of them so that they could run around. And But yeah. She really couldn't let them all survive because honestly, like the people in that town were more important. And, and the, the idea of like, not just that, not just like 
oh, we got to save the people of the town and let them free. Not just that, but it's like letting go of like knowing that you can't have this world because it's not real, really. It's, it's kind of pretend, um, but work to maybe find another solution. Do it, do it in a different way. Use your it, powers for other things. It was it was crazy that um, near the end of the last episode, you know, she's essentially defeated Agatha, yeah. uh, and, and tricked her and imprisoned her. Uh, but uh, but Wanda then goes back to the house that she created for her vision and her family. She puts her boys to bed, her twin mm -hmm. sons to bed, knowing that they're going to disappear in a moment. And she, yeah, that was so... And she stands there with vision, uh, knowing that, that once again, she's going to have to let him go. That really threw me off. I'll be honest. When I first saw the beginning of that whole scene, the, the wow. ending, I was like, okay, so she defeats Agatha. And I thought for some reason defeating her kind of like broke that tie. Because at some point in my head, I, I must have assumed that the fact that they couldn't exist outside of this reality was a spell somehow. And when she defeats her, it's like, oh, the spell's broken. You can all live happily ever after. Because she's kissing them goodnight, tucking them into bed, all this. I'm like, oh, it's a peaceful, happy ending. And then all of a sudden, boom, nope, you're all dead. I'll be like, wow, that was really a carpet out from under the feet kind of moment for me. I'm like, just what? This is not how I thought it was going to end. It was, it, it really was um, Wanda, though, accepting mm -hmm. for the first time the reality that, right. this, that, that she was choosing the people in the town over her own comfort as much as it was killing her um, to do that. And she was, she was letting go of those things that she loved um, yet again. In order she, to do what yeah. was right. she became a real hero. She did. I mean, honestly, it's, she gave up and sacrificed her own life, her entire life, really to, you know, make everyone else happy and, and survive and everything else and free them. Which is it was an it was an interesting spin on the series because you know like you said you don't really realize and she doesn't realize that she's kind of the villain, but then you, you're you're like I was I was rooting for the government at first I'm like stop her stop her, but then at some point you're just like leave her alone. It, it did feel very ET to me. I, I was disappointed we didn't see a bicycle and flying <laughs> over the moon, but I mean it it was very ET. Right. Ouch, idiot. Um. But yeah, I think it was a really good show. I, I'm excited to see if they, I mean, eventually they're going to tie it into something else because anything with a post credit scene or mid credit scene, which I couldn't help it. The first couple of episodes, I mean, learning that the credits were six minutes long on every episode, right. I'm just sitting here like, is there going to be an end credit scene on each episode? One episode? Is there an episode in the middle of the series that has a hidden credit scene that no one ever watched because they're like, oh no, it's good. But it's at the end of the last episode that there's a credit mid credit scene. I was like, Oh, okay. Makes sense. It's like a five hour movie. And the ending is the ending. Well, I mean, even, even the clever, I, I'm glad that you brought up the, the credit scene. It was like, remember that they had that, that Wanda and vision were having a fight. And, yeah. uh, and he, vision says something like, uh, this fight isn't over. And all of a sudden the credits roll like Wanda Wanda ends the episode to finish the argument. It was, <laughs> that yeah, was yeah, um, that was amazing. Yeah, um, you even even realize that the first the first three episodes they're all thirty minutes um, because yeah. those classic TV shows were thirty minutes long. I didn't pick up on that at first, but I was yeah. like, wait a minute, I did have that thought of like I was nearing the end. I was probably on the last three episodes or so. And I was looking through the menu there on Disney Plus. I'm like, Wait, why is why are the first few 30 minutes and these last ones are like 45, 50 minutes? Makes no sense. Then I realized, oh yeah, because those shows were 30 minutes, so you can't go past right. that. Exactly. As as things kind of change, uh, the shows get longer because we're getting we're getting outside the bubble information. Yeah, and um, it, it was funny too because you know. I know I mentioned it. I was like live tweeting the show to you, even though you've already seen it. I'm like, this is happening. And now this is happening. Like, no way. And it's like, it was interesting because I loved this. I didn't notice it at first, but then I noticed how 
each episode had its own commercial, but based around that time. And the Malcolm in the Middle one really caught, like, I, I noticed it the most with that one because they showed a parody commercial of those little shark bite gummy snacks. Right. And I had those, not a lot, but I bought those several times as a kid. And so that, that Malcolm in the Middle episode, like, I guess really hit me the most because of the fact that I loved that show. I remember watching the first episode on Fox. I was like, oh my gosh, I love this. And, um, I guess that's how they can show Malcolm in the Middle. It's like, how could they show that? Because that was a Fox thing. But then now Fox and Disney and Marvel, it's all one big happy family. Um, and I wanted to throw up a comment from a while back. Um, yeah. uh, my good friend, uh, we're not talking, uh, I'm not talking names, but I'm going to try this one, Pierre Domenico. I think I got that right because um, I'm terrible with names. I'm surprised I got that one. Um, I absolutely adored the Malcolm in the Middle uh, homage. I grew up with that. I had the chance to record an interview with Frankie Muniz years ago. Really nice dude. That's and cool. that's awesome. Wow. Um, yeah, Chris is a filmmaker. He's made a, a several short films and stuff. The The last one we talked about, we talked about it with Scott Schiaffo. Uh, was it um, Jesus versus Satan or something like that? I need to finish watching it. I've watched the first bits of it, and it's pretty hilarious. But that's really cool that he got to record an interview with Frankie Muniz. Yeah. Um, I've always heard like he was like a douchebag or something. I don't know. Oh, really? I have never met the guy. Oh. Or maybe that was just my my mind because he looks really? so young. He's like fifty years old, but he looks like he's twelve. He's not fifty. He's like like thirty right. or something. But maybe that's just me. Maybe I assumed he was going to be a jerk because he looks so young. He's like I'm a millionaire. I'm so old, but you think I'm twelve. <laughs> um, but yeah, that episode. He, I agree with him. Like that. I, I kind of grew up watching that show i mean it was i was a little older when it came on but still i watched it like every episode and i just loved how they portrayed all the characters it was kind of weird that they were missing one kid but i mean you can't have all the characters um but what about we didn't talk about this yet what about um quicksilver or who we thought you know yeah i will change there right i mean i think that um we we all know that they did a they they recast Pietro right that was yeah. the, that was the line that that Darcy said they recast Pietro um, we were all expecting um, Wanda's brother that we had met in Sokovia mm-hmm. and that we know was dead and uh, in that in that moment when you know she's just given birth to the twins and she's been thinking about her brother who's dead. And who knocks on the door but her brother? But it's Evan Peters, right? Uh, it's the one from the X-Men played by a different character. And, uh, you know, it's like it was like the writers were playing this big joke on us. Yeah, it was a huge prank because it's right. like not only it's like so layered because you see, OK, you're teasing the fact that her brother's coming back. Like how? I thought, okay, well, she can recreate vision and all this other stuff. So you can just bring her brother back. Why not? But then it's like, oh, I'm a different guy. So it's like, oh my gosh, that just opened. And it's a hint to the future. Like, we're going to open up, like, say, the possibility of the X Men coming over and being part of this world or Spider Man meeting the X Men. Like, all, this, all these possibilities are now that much closer because of this. But then they pull it out from under us, the rug, and they say, Oh no, nope, he's not really Quicksilver. We tricked you. But yeah, still, he, it was cool to see him as that character for just a little right. bit. Yeah, I thought that was neat. I, again, I really, I, I actually preferred his version of Quicksilver. Yeah, I didn't see all the X Men movies and stuff, but I did like see his bits and stuff. And like, I was a little disappointed that you know the real Quicksilver. I, I don't know who the real one would be, but the MCU version was dead so quick. Right. I was like, that's come on, that's Marvel's Flash. We have to see more of this character. We have to see it. But then they, they kill him all so quick. It's like Quicksilver uh-huh. Quicksilver had a long history in uh, mm-hmm. Marvel Comics. Um, yeah. That he wouldn't make it through, you know, half a movie. Um, that was a <laughs> that was a gif. Maybe they just didn't know how to how to do his super speed. I I, I think they could they could handle it. I think that um they needed they needed to really show Wanda is a character who is shaped by loss, right? And and her lo- the loss of her brother, the loss of Vision, 
the loss of her children, the loss of that that dream that she had of them together. I mean, I mm. think all of that just kind of led to her mental break. Um, yeah. I, I will say that the that the show in general, uh, it was, it was, it was, it was sad. I mean, I, I think that sometimes we we think that every 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 show needs to have a happy ending. Yeah, and this, and it, one, and this one didn't. Um, there were, I think, there are. If, if I'm if I'm going to give it a positive spin, um, Vision's quote that has can kind of stuck with me. His line about. Um, what is grief except love persevering? Um, right. I think that the idea that um, that if when you remember me, you keep me alive. You keep my love for me alive. That really struck with me too, because like, of course, I've been dealing with with my own loss for, in yeah. different ways, and I've kind of come to terms and like slowly, because everybody grieves differently, and sometimes you don't grieve, you put it off, and that's what happened to me for most of the year. So I kind of thought about that. I was like, you know, it's true because, like, you know, you you can't really have you can't really, well, can you really love someone that's gone if you never or lose? I don't know what I'm trying to say, but like, it makes so much sense. I'm like, oh, I instantly understood what he was saying, like, and it yeah. stuck. I think that the um, there are there are two things that make me hopeful um, in the end. One of them was. Uh, you had the white vision and Wanda's vision essentially yeah. battling. And then, you know, um, uh, Wanda's vision ends up sort of infiltrating um, that white vision, uh, his mind. Sort of like they, they merged and they came together. And so I really, I really saw that as a, a potential resurrection. Um, it it kind of was. I mean, was, I know I love the metaphors you're talking about. Like, if this has new pieces and this is, is it still the same, is it still the original? And I just knew that they were going to find a way to make this vision the new vision. And it's like, then the audience then asks, is this the new vision or is this the same vision? Because it's the same body. Right. But they, just, I guess they just took a bunch of white spray paint and ex over his whole body and rewired him and all this stuff. But it's essentially the same vision with maybe new skin or new pieces, but the insides are the same. So it makes me wonder, and, you know, is this going to lead in to, obviously it's going to lead to something. It's not the end of the story. Right. Well, and um, I think what this has been, what this is setting up for is that very last scene where we have Wanda in that cabin. Mm -hmm. and she's levitating and she's reading all of those books. Um, and what we, here's, here's what I know. She had to let her family go in mm -hmm. order to release the town, but she hasn't given up on getting her family back. Right. Right. That's what I took from that. Especially when you hear her kids, you hear their screams or cries at the end. And she's just like, Oh, like that really, uh, was it a realization that she saw them in some other realm or she realized, Oh my gosh, I know how to make them again. Right. You don't really know, which is yeah. cool. You know, Wanda Wanda has pure power, but she doesn't have the skill to manipulate it. And what that's going to mean is that she's going to need somebody to teach her. And mm. who do we know currently uh, in the MCU that is a master of the mystic arts? Exactly. Right. And who's also going to bring us 14 different Spider-Men. Right, right. Well, three, well, maybe. Right, so I, I really believe that um, this is that, that's eventually what's going to bring Wanda and Doctor Strange together in yeah. the uh, multiverse of madness. Which it makes me wonder: is Spider Man going to come first, or is the multiverse of madness Doctor Strange two? Is that going to which one of those are going to come first, and where they are in the timeline? Because you know, well. I think it's confirmed that Doctor Strange is helping Spider-Man or is involved somehow with Spider-Man and in tapping into the multiverse and all this other stuff. Um, cause we already know that, you know, um, Sam Raimi's Dr. Octopus is going to be in the movie. We already know that, you know, um, yeah, it's by, played by Alfred Molina. Yeah. And they've actually, they're doing a de-aging process where he's the same age 
And so his character is from the same timeline and the tam- same time period as it was in the original Spider-Man 2 film. Does that ever, does that ever concern you a little bit? Like, it's sort of mm-hmm. like um, in the in the Justice League when they used CGI to get rid of uh, Abel's facial hair. Yeah, and if you yeah. ever saw, um, was it Gemini Man with Will Smith? Right. Where he fights himself. And or, I watched I watched that movie and saw young Will Smith. I'm like, it's the Fresh Prince of Bel Air. Then I watched Fresh Prince of Bel Air, comparing the real young Will Smith with fake young Will Smith. Nothing close. But no. fake young Will Smith compared to real life old Will Smith, it still looks pretty cool. Right. But sure. you know, it's it's nothing like the original. Exactly. Or or um, I like Mandalorian. In Mandalorian, you have uh, Luke Skywalker, who makes an appearance. Mm-hmm. Um, as his younger self. And right? didn't they say like the next season or whatever, they're supposed to have that character, like Luke Skywalker, be there, like it, talking and everything? It wouldn't shock me. It wouldn't because shock like, me. Does Mark Hamill voice it and just the age to face? Like how? I don't know. I don't know. Um, you know, it's just, I, I just hope they do it well. That's all I'm saying. I, hope I mean, that's that's it. the next show I need to watch too, by the way, is Mandalorian, because I need. It's so good. Oh my gosh. I need so to watch good. it. I, you, if you, if you had told me uh, that I would love a space western, I would <laughs> think it'd be crazy. Um, however, yeah. it is it is brilliantly written. Um, the the main character is engaging um, and interesting. Um, again, um, it's really good. And when you realize that the the, the same guy who's uh, been instrumental in writing. Uh, you know, all of the MCU movies, right? The guy who plays Happy. Um, yeah. Um, it really threw me off when I found out he's the one, John John Favreau, that, yeah. that like, I had no clue that he was so heavily involved in making this movie. Right. He, and then did he direct Lion King as well? I, it wouldn't shock me. I, I mean, like... <laughs> um, considering, considering the characters he usually plays are rather kind of Kind of the butt of the joke, yeah. The comic relief that he has serious writing and directorial chops. I mean, I think that is just a testament to his work. And I mean, I the first, cool. yeah. And the first thing I thought of when I saw him um, on Iron was it Iron Man or Iron Man Two, whatever. <clears throat> I thought of this character. It was a very small character that he played in the My Name Is Earl sitcom. He played this like really jerk like McDonald's manager basically. Right. And I was like, man, that guy is such, he's so good at acting and he's so good at writing and directing apparently, which I never knew. I mean, but yeah, I need to finish watching um, Falcon and Winter Soldier and then I need to watch Mandalorian. So what are you Uh, thinking? I know, um, do I know you still have, you know, five more episodes to go? Yeah. I've seen the one. What is your, what is your first, um, kind of your first impression. Yeah, at uh, first I was like, I'm, I'm not going to like this at first before I saw it. Cause I was like, I don't know. Really, I never really liked the Falcon character on, on his own. I was not, I was not like, yeah, Falcon. Um, I didn't mind the character. I just didn't. I actually hate uh, Hawkeye a lot more. Cause it's like, what good is he? What, what good is you? What good is he? Like, it's like fake green arrow. I don't know. Maybe maybe I was more biased towards Stephen Amell's Green Arrow at the time, and then that's why I don't really hate him. I'm just like, eh. Um, that's why it really made me mad at Endgame when he didn't die. I was like, yes, yes. Oh, no. Oh, no. Um, but no, I, at first, I, I didn't know what to think. I was like, okay. I like, I like you know, the Winter Soldier. I like Bucky. Like, I thought that was cool. I like the fact that he's in that. But as the first episode, I'm watching it, and it's just like you see the whole – I'm not worthy of the shield and here's a museum. I'll give it to you and put it on display. Then he's like, wait, what you're giving it to that guy. And then you see him come out like I'm the new captain America. And I really got hooked at the end of the first episode, not at the end, but by the end I was like sucked in. Cause I didn't really watch all the captain America movies at first. I was big into iron man for some reason. And the Avengers, you know, the original like four or five characters in the first Avengers movie. And I was like, oh, okay. And then you start seeing all these other side characters come into play, and you're like, eh, I don't know about that guy. I don't know about that guy. But then they really shine when they're on their own and have a chance to really show what they are and who they are. 
And I think maybe that's why I don't pick up on those characters right away in these massive team up movies because they have two minutes on screen and you're like, oh, okay. And seeing them star in their own story, it's like, oh wow, you you got you have a good character. And I love the scene where he's flying above the plane and trying to get on it, and then like they're flying the missiles and and then he just kind of goes through and grabs dude out of the helicopter and all that and following it. I love the action behind it. Yeah. It was done so well and so like exciting. Like, is he going to make it? Is it going to fall? Cause when it says like it was um, when the suit flight system was malfunctioning and he's like starting to fall or whatever, I'm just like, oh, he's going to fall, but then he makes it. And so, I mean, I'm really excited to see where that show goes. It's really, I think that it, again, it's, it takes things in a very different direction. You know, in uh, in WandaVision, it was all about uh, dealing with grief and loss and mental illness and, and learning to cope. And and in, in Falcon and the Winter Soldier, it's about um, – uh, it looks at, you know, you've got Bucky who's dealing with um, post-traumatic stress disorder mm-hmm. and, and trying to make amends – for his past sins, even though he wasn't responsible, right? He was manipulated. Um, he still remembers it and he's trying to find a way to. Yeah. It. Um, and for, and for Sam, it is um, dealing with, um, with legacy, right? About is he worthy to represent um, Steve Rogers, who he's always put up on a really high pedestal. But it also get, it really talks about the the state of um, you know people of color here in America, especially if you're a veteran. Um, and I, and it, mm-hmm. I think it does take a very unflinching uh, look at how we treat our veterans and especially our veterans of color, right? Um, mm-hmm. and so I think that I think they they took some really bold stands here. I mean. Uh, the idea that we we know that ultimately Sam is going to become Captain America, mm-hmm. and uh, it's not lost on Sam that some people aren't going to like the idea that a black man is going to hold the shield and call himself Captain America. Right. Um, and but I but they but they put it out there, and I think they make a really strong uh, statement about. You know, Sam. Sam does it on purpose because he knows that by putting on that uniform and by by carrying that shield, he's sending a message. Just like the election of Barack Obama uh, sent a message mm-hmm. to every person of color that, hey, you can do this too. And I think that was a powerful statement. I didn't want and to then- show that for you, but. I'm, I did, I guess. Well, no, I kind of assumed that you know, he's going to become Captain America because in the comics he is Captain America. I mean, right. it does happen, so I figure you know they're gonna they're gonna tell it in a different way, obviously, but it's gonna get there. We know the we know the end game um, of that, and that reminds me, like you're talking about all these things, and it's like they're really pushing not pushing boundaries, but kind of like making bold moves. You know, it's totally unrelated to, to the comic books at all, but the Wonder Years. They're actually developing, I think, a re- not a reboot, but like sort of a reboot. Okay. Um, where it's actually going to follow, from what I've understood, um, I researched it a little bit. I don't know if it's in production or going to be in production or in post production, but it's going to be set in the same time frame and the time period of like the 1950s or 60s. And it's going to be featuring a black family. Really? So it's it's the perspective of that time, but told from a from a black family's point of view. I mean, I, which, really, I always felt like everybody hates Chris was sort of like the African American version of it. Yeah. But then again, it's like back in that time, you're, you're looking at like right in, in the middle of, and or right after the civil rights movements and everything like the 1960s, mid, I think it was mid to late 1960s because I know um, the brother, Paul, I think, no, Paul was the friend. What was his brother's name? Wayne. Um, his brother had had that friend who went to Vietnam and came back, and everybody's like, "Baby killer, we hate you." And his friend's like, "I don't know what I did wrong." And it's like such a deep moment. Yeah, and no one understands why they're hating on the guy. And so, seeing like a black family's perspective during that time is like, 
I don't know if we've ever done that without it being in some kind of weird comedic way, like Sanford and Son or whatever. Like, hey, dummy, oh, come on, pop. I um, mean, you know, we haven't really seen a serious take on like time frame from that point of view. Right. And some people are probably rolling their eyes like, oh, a black show, you know, but it's like their perspective and their life and their experiences are important too, just as much, I think. And if not more so, historically speaking, I mean, like they need to have their stories out there too. Yeah. And, I, and so I, I feel like, um, you know, that, that take on the Wonder Years from a POC perspective, I think is important. And it is that same, I think, very direct, honest uh, conversation mm-hmm. that Falcon and the Winter Soldier has about, uh, about you know, um, how we treat our soldiers, our, our, uh, our veterans of color. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, what is America? You know, um, what do we stand for? What do we believe in? Um, I mean, it's a big question about that comes up as a part of the show. And I, I think that, you know, some people, some people want to criticize it as being, it, it's too much of an agenda, right? That they should just mm-hmm. be a fun, you know, comic book superhero. Let us just have our fights and our villains and let's just, let's just make it entertaining. And I've got to say that I really appreciate this, this idea that, that you can you can tell a, an engaging story, and you can stand for something at the same time. I, I think that's powerful, and uh, and I and I think that um, and they do it really well. I think that's mm-hmm. probably the big thing for me is that um, it's not heavy handed. I mean, they they really had thought long and hard about how they were going to simply they were going to engage with this. And, and talk about issues that are really present right now. So anyway, something for you to look forward to. Yeah, I am excited to finish watching it because I honestly forgot about Mandalorian. So now I'm thinking of both shows. I'm like, oh, oh my gosh, oh my god! Like the first time I heard uh, like any noise from a baby Yoda was like a doll that they had at Target. Right. And he squeezes its foot. And he's like, <laughs> and I'm like, I have, I have a, uh, I have <laughs> a Grogu. Um, figurine in my in my room. Um, That's awesome. I've got a couple of the Mandalorian, uh, you know, uh, characters, uh, you know, and still in the boxes. Uh, so you buy two, so you can open one and play. Ha ha ha! Well, it, it's funny because it's it's sort of like you let people know that you like uh, Star Wars and the Mandalorian, and they're going to give you everything. Like, I believe it or not, right now I'm wearing, uh, you know, Grogu socks. Okay. Um, that the baby Yoda socks, um, cause they were given to me as a, as a present. Uh, and I love them. Hey, um, yeah. But you, 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 you let people know that you like Mandalorian and you end up with figurines and books and pictures and socks. Um, you know, yeah, so, I mean, I, I, I can do with some more socks. I need to do laundry. So I need some socks. There you go. I but mean, you know, I'm really looking forward to, uh, being able to talk with you about that. I am a huge, 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 uh, you know, Star Wars fan. And so I really, I'm not as big of a Star Wars fan, but I do, I do like Star Wars and I do appreciate it. So I'm, I'm excited to see what this is and where it goes and everything. Cause I love, I did love the Boba Fett character. And when I heard, I sound like I said Bobo Fett, Boba Fett. Um, and when they like talk about him coming back or like, you seeing the Boba Fett armor at least. I don't really know the details yet because I haven't seen it. But um oh baby Yoda socks giveaway. I go. mean, that would be nice. Right. I mean, hey, I'm baby Yoda socks, gloves, hats, whatever. Right. We I don't have do those it. things, but right. um, I mean I could do it. They would only be slightly worn, you know. Hey. I they I think they would increase in value. You get you get you get real baby Yoda socks. Yeah. All worn by Chris Kirkpatrick. I mean, that's something because you know who um, he just got, got over. Uh, what was it ninety or what, how many was it uh, on followers on Twitter? Ninety was it ninety one or something or two thousand two hundred? I can't remember exactly. But I've got two hundred and ninety. Two hundred ninety. Why did I see ninety nine? Because that's know. more than me. I've got like one hundred twelve. You're, like, you're like you're like trying to minimize my Twitter followers. I'm like, well, I have to win somehow. I know. I have like 115 or something. I don't know. But uh, 
I'm still trying to figure out how some people end up with like, you know, uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of Twitter. Followers. I mean, I, I, people following things and reactions of things on social media or anything like videos or anything like that. Like it's, it amazes me because I've, I've made several little videos, especially like including and especially this show. And then there's my uncle who never really made a lot of YouTube and he takes like a camera and he says, this is my collection of Wolverine action figures, or this is my collection of Superman figures. And some of those videos get like 9,000 views or something ridiculous. That's crazy. Or 10,000, not maybe at 10,000, but he's gotten up there like a few times, like 6,000, 7,000. He'll post one and it's like 990 views. Like, how are you doing this? Like, I don't know. And then it's, I think because he sometimes he'll use the TikTok app to record a quick little video and then post that on YouTube. So people see TikTok, they're like, ooh, what is this? And I don't know. Um, it's just crazy how like reactions happen and what people like or don't like. I mean, I'm I'm also interested going kind of going back to Star Wars in the um the Obi-Wan or Kenobi, whatever it's called. I maybe it's just Kenobi, I don't know, but that story coming soon. I guess they're shooting it now. And that'll probably be next year, maybe before that comes out. But that's interesting because yeah. I, I believe that's the time period between um, Return of the Jedi and then the um, no, no, no. That's the last movie. But in between episodes three and four, I think it is, because okay. it's when Obi Wan goes into hiding and he's like, "Oh, I must watch over the baby." And right. I think it's, I think it's supposed to be during that time. Okay. So it's because after it's after Revenge of the Sith. Yeah, I, for some reason I got the orders mixed up. I'm not used to there being a third trilogy now. Um, I'm, I'm excited. But, because I, I really like you and McGregor, and so I think yeah, he's done an amazing job with that. And game. he's it, it's going to be interesting to see him kind of older because are, are they going to just you know make him look like old Obi Wan or how are they going to do that? And they've also said that Hayden Christensen is coming back as well. Wow. So I don't know if it's his voice because by that point he's already Vader. Um, so if there could there could be flashbacks, there could be whatever, but they say he's coming in and he's involved in it. So my guess is, like, but if it's a voiceover, it's going to be James Earl Jones, right? I mean, or someone very close. So it makes me wonder if they're going to just you know do the whole face burn makeup thing where it's like he takes the helmet off and when he speaks, it's his voice. Right. I Maybe don't know. Maybe it's a flashback. It he, could be, before, or you know, later. before yeah, like the in between or something. There wasn't much time there between their last fight, right? And Vader, but who knows? I mean, that would be my could, guess. There could be plenty. Of, maybe he learns how to like force project himself um, as his old self or something. I mean, I'm interested though. I'm interested to see is there going to be a Yoda? Is there going to be? Because all these characters are alive at this point. Yeah. Are we going to see teenage Luke running around like, Uncle Ben, can I go and get some power converters? Like, no. Ah, oh, come on. And well, I, think that, I think the truth is that um, even though, you know, it wasn't until, uh, you know, R2-D2 and P3PO get get sent um, to uh, Tatooine, uh, mm. deliver Leia's message, that Obi-Wan Kenobi kind of reveals himself. Yeah, it's at that point. He's watching him the whole time, but he doesn't really reveal himself until, like, oh, look, you're about to be killed over there. Let me help you. Yeah. And he kind of has to step in at that point. Right. I, because, I'm guess, yeah. Yeah. I'm, guess, I'm, I'm guessing that we're going to see sort of what he's been up to during that period. Yeah. What's the inside of his cave look like? Right. You know, does it have posters of Justin Bieber? I mean, who knows? Maybe he's on TikTok all day. Right. That would really be disappointing, though, right? Yeah, I mean, it would be nice to know he's he's watching this the show, and his cave. Maybe the cave has I, good Wi-Fi. I'm sure that he's probably streaming it right now. But probably he, he's sort of a closet, a closet pod in a hard place watcher. So yeah, he went to the future and got got internet and came back. Yeah, I don't know. I don't want to talk about time travel because gone, I'm just gonna. We have gone full rando on this one. Um, yeah. I think this is probably a good time to go ahead and give them our information. If you guys haven't already, you know, uh, liked us or followed us on Twitter, uh, for, for Steven and for me and for, um, you know, pod in the hard place. 
I can't believe I just did this. Um, but yeah, actually, I have the full updated um, Twitter name. I didn't put up the old one or the one two four 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 two four four six. Thank you. Um, Thank you. As, as as awesome as that old name for me was, I'm glad that I finally have an upgrade. So. Yep. So it's you know just pot and hard place for us, and then the not so confusing at okay. CJ Kirk 1979, and then of course mine is at Stephen Colton, and we can throw up. Well, we already threw up Jay and Todd. We didn't throw them up. We put them on the screen. Um, <laughs> that was a confusing little exchange of words that I just said there. And where did the other one go? The main most important, no, I mean not most important, but like an important one. Um, we got to pull it up here too. I had it ready. So here it is. Oh, I love technology. Right. Even though it's like I have it all ready, but then that little glitch earlier threw me off. All right, we got to so show Mark Guggenheim because, you know, he's made a lot of this stuff possible. Like, And I think the giveaway was really cool of the arrow and everything. And I really need to get showtime. I think it is because, uh, Stephen Amell show heels is coming out. They finished filming the first season. So I don't know when it's going to air, but it's going to be an interesting uh, show to see what he does next. But wow. yeah, Mark, Mark has, you know, been so cool and has helped us. And it's, I think it's amazing that, you know, Mark Guggenheim was our first real interview. Yeah. Uh, you know what I mean? I mean that that was the first real interview that really got us started. Um, that that's amazing in my mind. This kind of blows it that uh, that he took the time to go and, and and speak with us and kind of got the ball rolling and going and it really did. Other I mean, before I was just kind of content with uh, talking about like, did you see Flash? Yeah, me too. Awesome. The end. But you know that kind of helped us push through that. I mean, we still do that, but so much more and then the giveaways never would have happened the you know trying to get other people to come on never would have happened it was kind of crazy that one of the first the first real um interviews really was one of the biggest ones for us because it's like part of the whole point of what we talk about even though arrow is over legends is coming back very soon and although he's only a consultant on the show at this point he still started it right I mean, we don't want to forget Greg Berlanti as well, but that guy's like, I, I don't want to say a ghost, but like he's never, he's so hard to, to, to track down and talk to. So I'm still thankful for Mark. I mean, I don't want, I just didn't want to keep talking about like Mark made this all by himself. Like, of course, Greg Berlanti was there to, to, along the way as well, but both of those guys are really cool. Yeah. I, mean, I can't say much about Greg because I don't really know him, but we know Mark and we know how like that he's really cool and gracious and, and generous. And I, I mean, just, it's awesome. Yeah. I think the truth is that they, um, we have to respect the, all the work they put in to create this universe that we really enjoy so much. You yeah, because I mean? without those shows, like, I mean, you don't have Arrow, you don't have Flash, you don't have none of those shows, you don't have any of it. And without those, we probably wouldn't still be talking about things. Right. Because what would we have talked about all that time, like reruns of Bewitched or something like did you see this episode where Samantha does this? Mm, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, everybody saw that like 40 years ago. I mean, right. we would have watched the two episodes and we would have been done. Right. Pretty much. I mean, there's still movies, but I mean, yeah, it's because of people like Mark that really made this show possible yeah. just with their stuff that they do. And he's uh, working on the, was it the lawn, the law and order or gosh, I Law and Order, and then he wasn't he working on Green Lantern as well? Yeah, they're they're still working on Green Lantern. Um, I don't know when that starts shooting, but I know they've gotten a, a, a good chunk of it written, and so I'm excited for that. And it's going to be on HBO Max. And then I'm, something I'm excited for. I don't we don't really have a lot of details yet, but it's coming up probably in the summer. But um, there's a film, like a not a documentary, but it's a film based on Kevin Smith making the movie Clerks. So it's called Shooting Clerks, and I know we kind of mentioned it when we had Scott Schiaffo on. Um, he's in the film as well, and he plays Kevin Smith's father um, in that movie. And so that's coming up. The, those guys are really close to releasing it. They started filming that movie years ago. It's probably been like 2014, 2015 or something. And I kind of – I kind of not really attacked them. I'm just like, oh, really? You're still making it? When, when, when? Finally, finally. And it was kind of one of those things where it's my theme. 
I kind of insult someone and then they kind of become friendly and then we have them on the show. Right. I, I don't know how that works. It just does. I don't okay. do it on purpose, but um, one of the main guys behind it, uh, Chris Downey and a, a couple other guys, I don't want to give out too much information because there's really none, none to give, but we're putting together this, like I had this idea of like, and I'm sure millions of other people out there with podcasts are going to do the exact same thing as I'm doing. Um, but I want to, kind of get as many people that worked on that movie as possible together and kind of talk about it because it's it's something that I love and I've been dying to see this story and it's kind of like it's the, it's one of the indie movies that I wanted to see the most I mean Northwood Pie just kind of fell in my lap and I love it but the shooting clerks have been watching like come on come on come on because I really I know the story of how they made clerks and all this but this story is like a drama in itself, the drama of making this movie. So I'm really excited for that. So we're going to talk to a lot of those guys coming up. Okay. That's Don't know fun. when, but summertime. I know, I know Scott's coming back for that one. Um, and a couple of the filmmakers themselves. And we've reached out. I mean, we've, but I mean, I, we've, we want to reach out to so many more people, but I don't know how many people are going to be willing to do this and how big of a show this is going to be. It's like This is going to be a two-part episode. It's going to be a four-hour episode because there's a lot of people involved in that movie. Right. Um, that, would be, that would be a really long, a really long recording session. Right now, there's about four or five names, I think. Okay. And uh, yeah, I'm excited. Yeah. I'm excited for that one. But yeah, that's going to be some time down the, lo- down, the, down the road. Not down the load. Um... But yeah, that's probably I'm I don't even want to guess in a month, but it's coming. All right, so um that feels like a good good time to uh end that. Um, I think so. I'm gonna I'm gonna wake up in about six or seven hours from now and go to work all over again and but I'll be off the next day. So even if I don't sleep tonight, then I'll sleep most of Tuesday and Monday afternoon, which will make Wednesday even more difficult. And then on Thursday, I go to get my second COVID vaccination. All right. So I'm excited about that. I think it's yep. a drive through where you just stick okay. your arm out the window. I don't okay. know. Maybe they'll have fries to uh, to go along with the vaccine. I, I think you earned it if that, if that once you get that done. Or a Happy Meal toy. <laughs> Whatever. I, my, uh, my wife and my uh, oldest daughter just got their second doses on Thursday. And uh, you know, the first dose w- wasn't a problem. The second dose – has certainly put them on their ass a little bit. So um, just kind of I mean, prepared a little bit. Yeah, and I'm excited to lick doorknobs again. Right. I mean. You've been, you've been holding back all this time. I've been wondering what the what a few of them taste like. And I just, that's kind of disgusting. I don't even know why I, I joked about that. <laughs> I mean, it, it was a hit at work today. I'm like, I said something about licking doorknobs and everybody laughed. I'm like, ooh, this is funny. Let me write that right. one down. Right. All right, well. It's been fun, and we'll get back to this next week. Um, and there won't be so much chaos and, and and running around for me to do. I'm just like racing home, like my wife's pregnant. I got to get to the hospital. Like that's what it felt like. Right. Like you got you to get there, hurry. Um, but yeah, so we'll we'll come on next week, and hopefully I have we'll have finished Falcon and Winter Soldier and The Mandalorian. I'm right. Challenging myself to finish both of those shows in the next week. There we go. Sounds great. I'll watch two episodes probably. No, I'll, I'm gonna watch them all. I'm 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 really gonna make, make an effort. There's there. I will say that Falcon and the Winter Soldier. You can absolutely do. There's two seasons of Mandalorian, and there's ten episodes or more each. So twenty hours. It would be a lot. It'd be a lot of Mandalorian to watch. I think I could finish it within a week. I okay. mean, I have I have a Tuesday and Thursday off, so. I mean, at, at some point, I'll probably have to mow the lawn and do some laundry. But, I mean, I think aside from that, I could maybe hold my phone and m- mow the lawn. Like, you know, I can, I can do both. Where there is a will, there's a way. Exactly. May the force be with me. Right. I, I, that was weird. Um, and May of 4th is coming up. <laughs> Almost. 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 In like a little while. All right. Well, have a good week, and we will. I'm looking forward to talking next week. All right. Have a good night. All right, you too. Bye. See ya.